Hey guys, it's Vazadel. Hope you're having an awesome day. So with the announcement of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 recently, I've been thinking about games that are a little bit rough around the edges, but are still fantastic. A great example of this, of course, being the original Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which is remarkable at its core, but does have a lot of bugs. It was rushed out the door by the publisher, and it led to it maybe not being as polished as something like a first-party Nintendo title. Now, I'm not giving a free pass to any game with bugs. If a game sucks, it's still going to be shit, bugs or no bugs. And yes, I was thinking about Fallout 76 when I said that. But uh, I realized too that a lot of my favorite games do fall into this category where they can be great, but maybe they suffered from being a little bit rushed and a little bit lacking in the presentation department. And there is a game that I absolutely love. It absolutely fits this category. And it went under a lot of people's radar. That game is called Elix. Came out in 2017. And when Elix came out, it was panned absolutely by all the critics. Uh, a lot of people online maybe gave it an hour or two, saw that it was a little bit buggy, maybe a little bit clunky. So they ignored the rest of the game and they just shelved it and, and put it away. And I think that's a shame because this game is very, very special. It is a bit different, but it is so unique as well. And an example of the criticism that it got is this IGN review. And you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. Even when everything is working as intended, the combat balance often feels absurd. Games like Dark Souls are punishing, but never feel unfair. Certain quests in Elix made me feel like I had to break its systems to win. Some required me to snipe a couple enemies from a large group at a distance, run several hundred yards to a shack with a bed, take a quick nap to regain my health and mana, and return to repeat this process four or five times. One boss took me almost two hours to slay because I had to get lucky and not trigger his unblockable, nearly undodgeable rock throw attack too many times. Now what you're hearing here is someone who wanted Skyrim and instead got, well, a game that's been made on its own merits. Unfortunately, that means the game is bad to some people. Now this game, Elix, was made by Piranha Bytes. They're a European studio who've been making PC games for a long, long time, starting with Gothic back in 2001. Some people have grouped these sort of games like Elix, The Original Witcher, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, and a lot of similar games that are glitchy or unpolished, uh, they might not feel like AAA titles, and they refer to them as Eurojank. Eurojank basically means that a game is going to be buggy, unpolished, and maybe feel a little bit rough around the edges. Now as the name suggests, a lot of these games are made by European teams because a lot of these teams are smaller than the teams in America and so on. But think of the term as being like Japanese role-playing game or JRPG. All that really means is it's a game like Final Fantasy. It doesn't actually have to be made in Japan for it to be one, which is why Dark Souls isn't a JRPG, despite being from a Japanese dev. A good example of Western Eurojank games would be a lot of the releases by Obsidian, and I enjoy a lot of their games too. Expect the Outer Worlds to fit in this category, and yes, fuck the Epic Store. The unfortunate thing about the term Eurojank though, is most people write off games when they hear it. They think, oh, it's not going to be like Breath of the Wild or the latest first party Sony game. It's janky. It must be rubbish. No thanks. This is a real shame because some of the best games I've played, they fall under this umbrella. They're often incredibly creative and they offer a point of difference to the very safe by the numbers games that a lot of the AAA industry turns out. In an ideal world, we could have the best of both. Often Eurojank games are creative, awesome, and it'd be great if these games were allowed some extra time in the oven to get all these issues ironed out. But the industry just doesn't work that way. Game development is expensive everywhere, and publishers want their money now. So a game like Elix would likely have had a very strict deadline, and the devs probably did the best they could with the time they had. This happens because these games aren't going to be juggernauts like Zelda or Red Dead Redemption. So publishers just don't allow the devs that much leeway. So I have some advice for the people who turn their nose at games with bugs or maybe outdated graphics. Get over it. Once you're immersed in the world, you'll forget about a lot of that stuff. And that's the key, world. A lot of these games genuinely feel like a huge world. Elix is a dangerous world, for example. There's so much choice. Around any corner could be a tough mob that you'll need to come back to later when you're a high level. And it's a very unpredictable game. You don't get that in a game like, let's say, Assassin's Creed. The Assassin's Creed games are mostly polished if you ignore Unity, and Ubisoft are trying to turn their games into RPGs apparently, so I figure it's a good example. What you get there is as safe as it gets. Look at this map. This isn't a game world, it's a hub with a series of activities. 
You don't venture out into a dangerous world where you start at the bottom and have to turn yourself into a powerful hero. You just run from outposts, towers, hunts, or whatever they call them the next time, and you bore yourself out on activities the designers only created that way, so you'd get bored and buy things on the cash store so you could skip them. That's the difference. These Eurojank games are always made with passion, for the love of video games, and are something these guys want to create. Most of the AAA polished games were created on spreadsheets with executives looking at what the flavour of the month is and how to reach the most people as possible, often meaning appealing to the lowest common denominator. These AAA games get polished because the publishers can afford to do it because they know a safe by the numbers game with pretty generic graphics will sell, sell, sell. But to those of us who want a deeper experience, we have to look outside the box. You can buy a game like Assassin's Creed and get a safe, Decent enough experience, but you won't remember it. They're released every single year, and each is just about as forgettable as the next. But I won't forget Ilix. In Ilix, I don't remember the bugs I encountered or the texture that was out of place. I remember the depth, the things about the game that I loved and remembered. I hate to give spoilers, but I think this has to be heard. There's a city in the game where you have an unbelievable amount of choice and influence on what goes on there. There's a political struggle, and you can play the factions inside against each other. Help people whose ideals you or your character feel are in the right, or you can just be a violent maniac and take over yourself. Whatever the case, what you do has huge consequences on the whole game. I remember on my playthrough, just playing through the quests and the city ended up being invaded and overthrown by an outside party, based on my choices. But then I looked into it, and there were so many different outcomes. This was brilliant, because it all happened through gameplay and interactivity. It wasn't just some well-produced cutscene. I, I was playing a video game here, and it was the elements that made a video game great that shone here above all else. That's what I get from Eurojank games, and that's what I want more of. I feel the game industry has pushed this idea that a great game is about graphics, polish, and cutscenes, and shoved it down a lot of people's throats. I know it's a subjective topic, but I feel games are at their very best when player interactivity and immersion are at the forefront. I've been more immersed by text adventures than I have by some of the recent rubbish we've seen like Anthem, and to see people buying a game like that in droves while Elix gets thrown in the discount bin is a real shame. Especially when it's mostly happening because of sites like IGN giving it a poor 4 minute review and you get other sites acting like it's a cheap budget Witcher or Skyrim when it is so much more than that. What's interesting as well is this perception of games needing great polished graphics and gameplay when this has been thrown out the window time and time again. Look at PUBG, or PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. Not long ago, it was the number one game on Steam, and it is as Eurojank as it gets. People seem to put up with it, and that was a competitive game where the shooting and moment-to-moment -moment gameplay are all it has. Yet we're seeing some games overlooked by the masses for not having those pretty amazing graphics or having wonky physics, despite RPG elements, the world, the characters, being the strong point of these titles. A positive, though, is the developers know that these games are only going to be played by people who can see past some of those presentation flaws. This means that usually they aren't dumbed down at all, and I think a lot of people who are getting sick of games like Mass Effect Andromeda, Fallout 4, and now Fallout 76, going down the route of following trends, limiting their RPG routes to appeal to the multiplayer crowd, and something needs to fill that void. These games can do that. I got far more fun and fulfillment out of Elix than I did with Fallout 4. I think these games should take advantage of that too. We don't need every single line of dialogue to be voiced. I would much rather read high quality rich text in a dialogue heavy game than have to hear mediocre rubbish with a lack of choice to ensure money is saved on the voice acting budget. These games have tight budgets already. Focus on the game, not the voice acting. Another great aspect is that many of these games don't have quest markers. There's nothing more satisfying than having to actually use my brain and follow directions in a game, rather than following an arrow around the map while I browse on my phone as I mindlessly run to the next objective. Actually making me think keeps me immersed. Elix had this at times, but certain older Eurojank games like, again, Vampire the Masquerade and Gothic absolutely nailed that, and I'd love to see this continue. Supporting a great game that fits this category often pays off really well also. If you play the original Witcher, it's certainly a janky game, and it is far different to The Witcher 3. But if this initial game wasn't supported, if people didn't come back for more of characters like Geralt and Triss in Witcher 2, we never would have gotten The Witcher 3, which people consider a classic. It has to start somewhere. 
and most studios don't start out with 300 people. They build up, and when they start out they just won't often have the resources to iron out every single bug or perfect every mechanic. When a game has something special, that's what we should focus on. The good news is, we're seeing a shift in the right direction. Kingdom Come Deliverance is the very definition of Eurojack, and yet it sold very well on Steam. I did notice a lot of resistance, mainly from console players, but these types of games are usually more popular with the PC audience anyway. But it was a great game that focused on what makes an RPG and a world great, and yes it has some bugs, it has some issues that you get with a medium sized team, but the audience seemed to love it, and I hope we see publishers take notice of that as well. Then you look at THQ Nordic, they're owned by a billionaire, and are constantly buying up IPs who were made by teams with a medium size. You could even say Darksiders 3 fits the Eurojank description, and apparently that actually met its sales targets. So that's further proof that heading in the direction of mid-budget and prioritising the gameplay and world over the presentation is the way to go sometimes. So what's up and coming? Well, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 of course, which I mentioned is one to keep an eye on. It's made by a smaller team and it will likely be quite Eurojank 2, so I hope it doesn't get overlooked and plenty more people buy it than just the fans of the original, if it's a great game. The Outer Worlds is coming, uh, we won't talk about that because it's an Epic Store exclusive. And then you've got games like Divinity Fallen Heroes, in the same universe as Divinity Original Sin, only this time it's more combat focused. I'm also hoping Elix 2 will be released next year, and that should be great as well. I see Eurojank games made by medium sized teams as often having a ton of ambition and risk put into them, and they always keep me excited to dive in. I want great games in this category to keep being made, for them to find their audiences, and to ensure they don't die out making safe and bog ordinary the only standard for anything that's not made by like a one or two man team. Let's support the great Eurojank titles so they get the credit they deserve, and that way next time these teams will make that fantastic game, but they'll have the time and the money to really polish it so everyone is happy. So those are my thoughts on Eurojank. Yes, I think that most games that fit into this category are awesome, and I hope more people will give them a chance. Give them more than a couple of hours if you're on the fence about something that's a little bit clunky, and you might find something that you absolutely love. Elix was that for me, and there's many more like that out there. Thanks very much guys, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a like, click the subscribe button, and leave a comment down below as well, because I'd love to keep this conversation going any way that I can. Thanks again guys, and see you next time.